That was uh, the incomparable Tom Jones on the Ed Sullivan Show in April of 1968. Uh, one minute and 24 seconds, one of the shortest songs. I think they played it awfully fast. I love that clip because the drummer is just on fire. He just looks like an octopus the way he's, he's rocking that drum kit. That song was written by Les Reed and Gordon Mills, and it became a hit in 1964, 1965. Amazingly, it was so popular that the Ed Sullivan Show had it on twice in just five weeks in 1965, and it just didn't die. So the clip we just saw was three years later. Uh, the song was first offered to a singer named Sandy Shaw, who has disappeared into obscurity, but it was recorded by the then unknown Tom Jones. It was intended as a demo to entice Sandy Shaw to record it for real, but she heard his rendition and thought that it was way better than anything she could possibly do herself, uh, which is a credit, uh, frankly, to her as, as an artist. Uh, some industry experts state that Jimmy Page of uh, Led Zeppelin and none other than Elton John, who was at that time still Reginald Dwight, were studio musicians backing that demo, but Reports uh, actually uh, are in conflict, so it's not clear that that was uh, really true. Um, interestingly, uh, one year before the clip we just saw in 1967, this is a weird fact I learned from the New York Times crossword puzzle uh, a few days ago, is that in 1967, Jimi Hendrix, one of the greatest guitar players obviously of all time, actually was the opening act for, you ready for this, The Monkees in 1967. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but the Mo Monkees were a monstrously successful act in that time period. In fact, in that year, or perhaps it was the year after, they outcharted the Beatles, did the Monkees, which is a remarkable uh, achievement. Anyway, uh, one thing that's unusual about the song, it's not unusual, is there's no chorus. In fact, the hook is the very first words of the song. Uh, and so it's, it's pretty interesting. So well, I, I came up with this title because I ran into this clip of Tom Jones and I just loved it so much. And it made me think about uh, how it's not unusual for markets to get unusual and for things to get way out of whack, particularly in response to the pandemic. So let's get started. I have 44 slides today. And then uh, Andrew is going to take over the fun facts of total return. And then I'm going to uh, consolidate the questions per usual and uh, get back with a Q&A. So let's start out with the, the fun, Fed funds rate. Uh, the real Fed funds rate, this is a, a, a mismatch of timing a little bit because the CPI is a monthly data point and the Fed funds rate uh, is every day. So it's not exactly up to date, but basically it's the right picture. We have a very unusual, so this is unusual, uh, fun, Fed funds rate versus the CPI because as of the last CPI print, it was negative 400, sorry, 749 basis points. So we have incredibly negative uh, interest rates on a real basis uh, on, on the Fed funds rate. They're starting to catch up because the CPI is no longer rising on a year over year basis. In fact, it's probably gonna fall on a year over year basis through the end of this year, which amazingly is already half over. It's so hard to believe. I felt like I took off my Happy New Year's party hat like two weeks ago. And here we are coming up, uh, heading towards the 4th of July. But the, Fed, the, the uh, CPI rate is likely to go down. And of course, the Fed funds rate is likely to go up. Uh, in fact, it's almost uh, certain to be going up based on the Fed's own prognostications. I'm going to go through uh, in a little while the bloodless verdict of the market, um, uh, which shows some of the strange things that have happened. We've had a lot of volatility in markets over the past year and certainly on a year and certainly on a year to date basis. But um, since the Fed meeting, uh, we've had very little volatility. Uh, matter of fact, I'll go through that right now. On a year to date basis, we have uh, the worst performer out there is Bitcoin, uh, down about 34%. The NASDAQ down 22%. This is through, uh, th this, is through uh, uh, this morning, earlier on. And then we have, uh, the only thing that's up is the commodity index. The Bloomberg commodity index is up 38%. Uh, year to date. Uh, now, over the last five years, we've had massive uh, dispersion of returns also among asset classes. Bitcoin is the big winner over the past five years of the asset classes that I track on my daily monitor. It's up 1,015% over the last five years. So uh, the, 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 the last shall be first when you compare uh, uh, f five years to year to date. Also over the last five years, the NASDAQ is up 103%. The S&P is up 86%. 
um, we have uh, we have the long bond is up two percent over that time period. So it's a lot of a lot of dispersion since the Fed meeting, though, where where there's massive volatility going into the Fed meeting in May, and then subsequently later in the month of May we saw a rally. Uh, what we have is almost no change uh, since the Fed meeting. Uh, bond yields are up between five basis points for the ten year and 10 basis points for the two years. So it's been a moderate upward movement in interest rates across the yield curve of a high single digit basis points. Gold is down a percent since the Fed meeting and most risk assets are down a very small amount. Bitcoin is the worst, it's down 24%. Uh, the NASDAQ is down six since the Fed meeting. Just about everything else is either flat, the US dollar is flat or down a couple percent. Junk bonds down two, the S&P down three. So uh, the, the market has stabilized, uh, which is one of the more unusual stable periods, talking about it's not unusual since the, the pandemic came around, but we're dealing with these negative interest rates, which are certain to be getting less negative on the Fed funds rate with the CPI, probably going down into a five handle by year end, and uh, uh, the CPI going to the five handle, and the Fed funds rate almost assuredly going higher by at least 100 basis points between now and year end. I've said somewhat facetiously, but I actually mean it somewhat seriously as well, that we should replace the Federal Reserve with the two-year Treasury yield. The red line is the Fed funds rate, and the blue line is the two-year Treasury, and it's quite obvious that since 1996, so it's not a short phenomenon uh, time-wise, we see that the Fed funds rate follows the two-year Treasury, and it, all you need to do is to watch the two-year Treasury. You don't need 800 PhD economists to uh, set the Fed funds rate on a lag basis versus what they end up doing anyway, which is the market's behavior. Now, inflation is very much in everybody's mind, and uh, we've seen different messaging about the inflation rate started out that uh, Janet Yellen and others, Jay Powell, said it was transitory. That was about 15 months ago, and then they tried the messaging that it's good, which didn't work very well because nobody thinks inflation is good who's on a fixed uh, sort of a salary or fixed income. Uh, then it's turned into corporate greed and now it's turned into Putin's fault. But of course the inflation was largely fueled by excessive government spending. Uh, inflation is always and forever a monetary phenomenon and the outrageous increase in the money supply and the deficit and all those uh, excessive stimulus programs are certainly behind the inflation with some of these variables also being contributing but the headliner is, of course, the government stimulus. So we talk about inflation. I like to look at export and import prices as the best measures of inflation because they're not screwed around with. When you look at the PCE and the CPI, there's all kinds of adjustments and substitutions. The methodology has changed a lot. In fact, if you ran the Jimmy Carter uh, into Gerald Ford inflation rates using the methodology we use today, Inflation did not get to 14% using today's methodology back in the late 70s and early 80s. It only got to 9.1 if you applied today's methodology uh, to that. I just read a research report on that this morning. And so the inflation rate at 8.5 on the CPI using today's methodology is exactly in line. It's, okay, it's 60 basis points less, but it's in line with the inflation of uh, the 70s and 80s. And of course, it's driven by energy. There's a lot of parallels I talked about. I think I was the first one to talk about the comparison of Jimmy Carter to uh, Joe Biden, and that's starting to become more mainstream. But anyway, I like export import prices because they are not adjusted, they're just prices. And so we see year over year, the blue line is exports, they're up almost 18%, and the red line is uh, import prices, and they're up about 12% which sort of, if you average the two and say that's sort of the inflation rates, it's around 14% uh, right now. So inflation's very high and it hasn't come down hardly at all. We see a little tick down. We expect these inflation rates are going to fall as we move uh, later into this year. Uh, and then the question is, will they fall even further? Uh, there's a growing narrative that there's been problems in the way uh, retailers have stocked up their stores and their inventories, and that they've actually stocked up too much of an anticipation of further spending, spend, spending patterns that are more uh, in line with the lockdown period, and that's not the case. And so we're starting to see some failures at, at retailers because they're, they're missupplied. I think it's possible 
that the present services uh, spending boom, the travel uh, pent up demand that's out there for this summer, I have a feeling that that's going to be a temporary phenomena as well because people just don't have the money. With gas prices here in California at about $7 a gallon and nearly $5 a gallon uh, nationwide. And of course, everything is shipped using diesel uh, for the uh, goods economy. And obviously those prices have skyrocketed. Uh, this is gonna cause, uh, ultimately, people like to say the cure for high prices is high prices. And certainly there's gonna be less driving, I think, if gas prices sustain at these levels. So the, the commodity index has really been on a tear. And this is the Bloomberg Commodity Index. Uh, I think today it will close at a new high. This is using, uh, I think, intraday data. So we see there was a moment uh, a few months ago that we were at 140, the high on the BCOM index. But today we're uh, at 136, which is a new local high. And one thing that is really uh, interesting is how persistent this trend has been. It's been going on for about a little over two years now. It began with the bottom of commodity prices and risk assets in March, April of 2020, but it's just been straight up. There's almost no correction. The only uh, meaningful pullback, and it wasn't that meaningful, was in the fourth quarter of last year. And of course, it was very quickly reversed. So commodities are obviously in a, a secular uptrend, and uh, that's without the dollar even going down, which we're going to look at uh, in a few minutes. Food inflation is really what's getting people angry, I think. Uh, food at home is up 11%. Interestingly, food away from home. I don't know how that's calculated exactly, but that's up 7.2 using this index. So food inflation uh, is going to be a continued problem, I think. Uh, it is. I think the narrative is true that the war in Ukraine is causing some havoc with food prices, particularly the, the uh, wheat prices, perhaps barley and soybeans as well. And uh, there doesn't seem to be any end in sight for that, that shortage, and um, I'm hopeful, uh, but uh, a little bit pessimistic, but still trying to cling to hope that we won't have uh, further food shortages as we've seen, say, in, in the baby formula. This is a chart I've used a couple of times before. I call this the chart of the year so far, and it's really interesting to look at it because we're breaking personal consumption expenditures into three cohorts. One is the blue line, which is durable goods. One is the black line, which is non-durable goods. And there's the red line, which is services. I am just so struck by this chart because for the four years prior to the lockdowns, we, one can see that all three of these components were rising consistently, uh, persistently, gradually, and together. If you look at all three of the lines, there were, oh, there's almost no real difference point to point over that four year period. Then the lockdowns come and of course, all spending uh, abruptly halted for all of these three cohorts. But then the money came from the government and we say the blue line, which is durables, exploded higher and is still about, I'd say 20 to 25% above what the trend would have taken us to if we hadn't had all of these gyrations uh, in the pandemic and afterwards. It's pretty clear that durable goods spending has been brought forward and it will take years since these are long-term purchases, years of relatively low durable goods to get us back down to the, the trend line. Also, non-durables are well above the trend line uh, that was in place pre-pandemic. And so one can expect a, a, a couple, three years at least of, of, of weakness in non-durable spending. And then you have services, which has made it back all the way to trend, will probably go above trend with all of the uh, pent-up demand that's out there for travel, leisure, and hospitality uh, this summertime. But one has to ask the question, where is the growth in personal consumption expenditures gonna come from? Services is gonna be a temporary spike, and then that will probably turn into a drag. We'll probably have a real drag on personal consumption expenditures. This is the reason why one should expect continued economic sluggish behavior, not a recession, I don't think, this year, but probably next year based upon how these things are developing. Uh, because where's the growth going to come from? We had a negative GDP of about 1.5 in the first quarter that just got revised a little bit weaker. And the GDP now for the second quarter, which is still a little early to make a, a, a firm judgment about, but it's at 0.9% for the second quarter, which means that for the first half of this year, if those numbers hold up, we'll have negative real uh, GDP 
uh, in the United States. So it's not a very strong uh, growing economy, and yet the Fed is raising interest rates because they're behind the curve, and quantitative tightening has started. So it's uh, difficult to see where the earnings are going to come from, where the growth is going to come from, and therefore, and with the Fed doing its thing, it looks like we're going to continue to have headwinds for a lot of risk assets as we move into the second half of this year. Consumer sentiment uh, is also uh, eroding. There are two different measures that are on the screen now. One is the conference board, which has held up pretty well. It's still reasonably high, but the trend is uh, down in recent uh, readings. And then we see the red line, which is the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index, and it's really low. It's, it's at basically levels consistent with recession. That's because there are two big components in the University of Michigan Consumer Confidence Index, and it has to do with it's now a good time to buy a car. And that's been, not surprisingly, one of the lowest readings of all time because car prices are so, still so elevated. All used cars are uh, not rising anymore. They're actually declining a little bit. And there's also, is it a good time to buy a house? And with home prices up 37% on a median basis over the past two years and mortgage interest rates having doubled from about 275 to about 550, it's not a good time to buy a house uh, relative to two years ago, obviously. Incomes are not up anywhere close to that. And so we see those components are, are dragging on this index. If the blue line starts to fall more, uh, that will be us, put us on more significant alert for a recession. One thing that's interesting is that consumer revolving credit has really started to explode to the upside. It was uh, running up uh, Positive numbers, this goes back to 2000 during non-recessionary periods and slight uh, bouts of negative uh, net monthly change and revolving credit. And then it collapsed, of course, during the, the lockdowns. But uh, now, uh, suddenly, out of nowhere, we're starting to see very substantial uh, revolving credit. I, I assume that this is probably for travel plans for the upcoming uh, season here with uh, hotel prices up a lot. Airline prices up something like 35%. Uh, uh, gasoline, obviously, up a lot. Uh, I don't think people have, have purchased their gasoline for their trip yet, but the fuel prices embedded in the airline tickets might be in there. This is this bears watching because it's showing a consumer that is dipping into uh, the, the, the debt uh, situation again, which uh, doesn't bode very well. There's probably some inflation uh, input into this too. Because, you know, one thing that I have to laugh at, I've said this before on TV, one thing I have to laugh at is when retail sales come out and they're up like 0.9, people say the consumer is doing really well. Well, in that same month, if the CPI is up 0.9, uh, it's probably not very likely that there was any gain in retail sales whatsoever. People paying more for the same amount of stuff is not exactly a great sign, but that's uh, kind of the insidious nature of inflation. So let's talk about uh, monthly payment affordability in housing. This actually takes the monthly mortgage payment on the median sales price of an existing home nationwide. And there might be a little bit of funny business going on in the series because I think there's been a, a mixed shift uh, in the way in, in uh, the median home price. I think the, uh, there's more sales of, of higher priced homes and of lower priced homes going on and that affects the median. But nonetheless, this gives us some information we see that back in pre-pandemic, it was $1,000 was the monthly payment on the median sales price of an existing home. And now it's 68% uh, higher than that at $1,000, uh, nearly $700. Let's just say some of that's mixed shift. So maybe the monthly payment really on the same home from uh, two and a half years ago or so is up 50%. So one cannot really expect the housing market to be supportive of future economic uh, gains with this type of uh, lack of affordability. This is literally a chart on affordability. This is the average monthly payment as a percentage of median household income. And uh, don't, uh, you, you gotta trust your eyes here. It's less affordable now than it was before the global financial crisis when everybody thought the world had gone crazy. Now, I will say one thing uh, about this, and that is that this is using a 30-year uh, mortgage rate. Back pre the crisis, we're starting to get all kinds of funny types of mortgages. So it may not be a direct apples to apples comparison, but uh, the affordability is pretty low and we don't have those wacky mortgage products around today that we had pre global financial crisis. So the, this affordability really is a strain. 
uh, is the median household, the average mortgage payment as a percentage of median household income, which is uh, obviously a very, very high. Here's the uh, proof statement that home prices are up 37% over the last two years. This is the case Shiller U.S. national average, and there it is, 37%, which is a larger two-year increase than uh, any observation part of the global financial crisis. So I think one has to be pretty uh, Pollyannic to believe that housing is going to be a big supporter of the economy. Also, mortgage rates are uh, obviously up a lot. Uh, we the, the scale here is huge. It goes back to the 80s, where we see that it's up at you know nearly 20% uh, back then. Now we're down about 510. Uh, but one thing that is still maybe supporting housing, one reason to not be terribly pessimistic, although it's not going to be a fueler major fueler of the economy, we still have the CPI above the mortgage rate. So it's not like uh, you have very high real mortgage rates. In fact, they remain negative, which uh, the Fed may be uh, working to do something about. Here is the 30-year mortgage rate. Uh, just to put it in context, it looks like maybe it's bottomed, just like it looks like all interest rates maybe have bottomed after a 42-year type of bull market or 40-year bull market in bonds. Uh, it does look like the trend has been broken and mortgage rates may be headed higher. Um, also, we see another inflation driver. This is a reason why inflation won't come collapsing down. The, home, the house price to rent ratio is on the moon. Uh, basically, the house price to rent ratio is at 140, uh, which is up mightily. It's up by about 30 percent again, uh, even more than 30 percent since pre-pandemic. And that means that one can expect rent prices to go up. Rent is not directly calculated and put into inflation numbers. They use something called owner's equivalent rent, which is a non-existent thing. It's not a real price, it's just a survey, but that's running at 5% right now is the owner's equivalent rent, uh, which is the biggest part of the shelter component of CPI. And the shelter component is one third of the CPI. So there's gonna be upward pressure on the CPI because rents need to go up. Uh, not surprisingly, home price appreciation leads to rent inflation. And we've got this with an 18 month lag. And this suggests that rent could be expected to sort of double uh, from a, around a, this index is a real price. This index shows home price uh, rent is right about 7%, a little over, and that maybe it's gonna go up to uh, 10 or even 11% uh, following this trend. That's gonna keep inflation from uh, uh, taming back down to the levels we saw pre-pandemic. Something else is very odd in the economy. This is very unusual is and people talked about this. We see the job openings, which is the blue line and the number of unemployed, which is the orange line and the gap, which is the black line in the lower panel has never been wider. We've never had a situation with twice as many job openings as there are unemployed. Why is that happening? It's getting, it's getting a little late in the game uh, to say that it's due to all that money we sprayed around over a year ago. There's probably still some residual value of that, but uh, some people have dropped out of the labor force. The crime rate is up, and I think some people have gone from the labor force to the crime force. That, that probably explains some of this, but also there's been a very substantial growth in small business formation. We see applications are basically running at double of the pre-pandemic level. So a lot of people apparently have started some sort of home business or doing some sort of a, a, a small small business or part of a, a gig economy or something like that. And uh, that could be one of the reasons why we have developed this huge gap. Now, most small businesses fail in their first couple of years. So we'll, we'll see if that uh, happens again and if that corrects some of that very unusual a gap between uh, unemployed and job openings. So I talked about performance over the last five years and since the Fed meeting, this is a lot of asset classes year to date and it really is an unusual situation. We have risk assets and non-risk assets. So equities and fixed income all in the red and kind of all the same. We see at the S&P, uh, this was as of June 6th, uh, down 13, Dow Jones down uh, about nine, we see a lot of equities down across the world in that 10% to 15% zone. NASDAQ is the worst. Then you go into fixed income and it really isn't much better. You've got EM Sovereign down 
You've got uh, Bloomberg Ag down nearly 10%, by far the worst uh, first six months of the year on record. In fact, the first four months of this year was the worst four months of investment grade bond performance on an absolute return basis since 1978. So that was a huge interest rate increase then, but at least you were starting with some yield, whereas we started this interest rate increase with very low yields uh, heading into 2022. We see the dollar is up uh, 7%. Uh, it's, it's not up much uh, over the last five years. It's up a little bit. Uh, it's, it's flat since the Fed meeting, but it is up 7% year to date. And then we see commodities, which are basically all up except copper. Uh, the big winner, of course, is the energy sector, which is up 50, 60 percent. And the VCOM index is at a new high again today. Uh, and the uh, oil price has been very sticky above, say, $110 for West Texas Intermediate. One of my favorite slides, this I've used this for a few years now, is dividing the United States into three categories of, of uh, asset returns. The red line is the S&P 500. The black line is the Bloomberg Aggregate Investment Grade Bond Index. And that blue line is the Bloomberg Commodity Index. And it's sort of fascinating that from 1994 into 2011, all three of these very different asset classes had about the same total return. A little bit of deviation along the way, but from 1994 to 2011 or 2012, exactly the same or in the same ballpark of returns. And then Europe went negative and we went on quantitative uh, easing as kind of a permanent strategy. And it's pretty clear that those two things together created divergent returns. The one being the S&P 500, which went up about fourfold. And then we see the Bloomberg aggregate, which does its thing plodding along, although it's turned negative on a total return basis uh, over the past year or so. And then we see the commodities were very negative. The scale here is log scale. So it's, uh, I guess it's not a log scale, but it doesn't matter. We see commodities were down from uh, 2011, down pretty sharply into uh, the pandemic. And ever since then, they're up rather mightily, although the scale is so big here, it doesn't look that big. It looks to me like uh, the bonds, interestingly, and the commodities have sort of converged. Uh, stocks are living out there in a world of their own. I think commodities are a far better investment than stocks. That's been the case. I talked about that two years ago. That's certainly been the case for those two years. It's certainly the case for the last one year and year to date. I think the commodity cycle is likely to content. Uh, that's been the case through history. And then when the opposite happens, when the commodity cycle tops and the stock cycle bottoms, it reverts all the way back down. Right now, it looks like we're strongly in the movement of the commodity outperformance. Here's just the S&P 500 and how it's been developing. It surely looks like it's under pressure. Uh, once you get the Fed tightening at twice the speed as they did in prior tightening periods uh, in recent, uh, in recent uh, economic cycles, and now we have QT. Uh, we're starting to see what looks like a, 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 a strong headwind for the S&P 500. We see that obviously it's negative year to date and uh, below all the moving averages, which are trending uh, in the downward direction. Um, a lot of cycles seem to have turned. I talked about this two years ago. It's been a theme for Double Line ever since uh, the pandemic came. And that is that it looks like all of these long-term trends of outperformance of growth versus value, of cyclical versus defensive, of US versus the world. And we'll take a look at a few of these uh, in these charts. But this is growth versus value. And it's had an outrageous reversal from 1.8 on the scale on the right-hand axis. And it's dropped by about 20% uh, or so. So value has been outperforming. Um, this is, uh, has been a big move. So it's not surprising that it might take a, a, a pause, but uh, this looks like one of these uh, cycles that has been broken. Also, the NASDAQ has been underperforming the S&P 500 over the last two years. Uh, we have got to the same type of outperformance as we saw uh, running into the dot-com top, where it was actually really just vertical back in the late 90s, but we repeated it. It took longer. It was quantitative easing that helped but we see that we got back to that same extraordinary uh, overvaluation of the NASDAQ 100 versus the S&P 500. That trend looks as well to have topped. Also, the United States had been outperforming the rest of the world mightily. This chart only goes back to 2018, but it was happening for seven years before that as well. 
with the U.S. outperforming by multiples the rest of the world. Uh, Europe uh, stopped underperforming back in 2020. We talked about that. And we see that Europeans stopped underperforming, wasn't doing much uh, for much of that uh, two-year period. But year to date, and certainly in the recent months in particular, Europe's been outperforming. And uh, we expect that to continue because it's interesting that Europe's been outperforming uh, e even though the dollar has been strong. The dollar is up about 7% year to date. Also, uh, what has not reversed, but is still looking at a stretched valuation is the S&P 500 versus emerging markets. We're back to the levels of the 90s again, uh, with S&P outperforming by 400%. If you look at that right-hand scale from about a 1.0 to a 4.0, uh, going back to 2011, this, for this to powerfully reverse, I think we need the dollar to break down, which has not happened yet. The dollar needs to drop down below 100 to really have a convincing breakdown. When that happens, I'm going to be a very loud advocate of emerging market equity. Emerging market equity is no longer underperforming. One can see that the red line has stopped going up, not terribly convincingly yet, but it has stopped going up. And uh, once the dollar falls, which should happen with everything that's going on uh, with our country and also what's going on with our deficit, uh, although the uh, trade deficit had a pretty big uh, decline in the most recent reading, but it's really the budget deficit plus the trade deficit, which are very, very uh, high levels as a percentage of GDP. And as I've said repeatedly, that will ultimately bring on a dollar bear pattern, but we haven't seen it yet. Here is the dollar index. It looks like sort of a triple top at this point, about that 103 level. I think we kissed 105 intraday. But we're going to watch to see if the dollar, I'm going to start getting quite negative on the dollar if it drops below 100. That's only about 3% away from where it is now. Uh, and I, I, I think that the dollar uh, will continue the pattern going back to 1985 of lower highs that we've seen. We've seen three big runs in the dollar, one into 1985, one into 2000, and one into basically the present moment or the past few years. I think that we will not be going to 120 on the dollar. In fact, I think we're going to be going ultimately below 70 spot 698, which was the low back there in the global financial crisis. Here's the aggregate index total return going back. Uh, there's many, many lines here, but it goes back to the 80s. So basically the whole bull market time period in bonds and that black line down there at the bottom shows that this is the worst year for the ag uh, ever. Uh, 1980 was worse. Uh, that, they didn't have the numbers daily back then, so the, the lines look funny for the early 80s. But we can see now that there has been no year that's even close to as bad of this total return. And so there are core bond funds out there that are down 15% year to date on a total return basis. Uh, so uh, the ag is down around 10%. But there's a lot of underperformance out there in the bond fund active management industry. I'm glad that uh, Double Line is not participating in that underperformance. We've had a, a pretty good run here over the past couple of years. Here's the credit uh, performance year to date by all kinds of different slices of the bond market. Everything's negative. The only one that is close to zero is bank loans, which are down about a percent. They were hanging in there until the month of May, where they had a really rough couple of weeks. The middle of May was a very rough period for markets. It, it seems like a long time ago since we've been so stable uh, in recent few weeks. But nonetheless, we're negative on everything. The worst is, of course, investment grade triple A's, double A's, their longer duration. Their spreads have widened a little bit, too. Uh, so we've seen interest rates rise and credit spreads widen. And so there's nowhere to hide. Uh, the, the, uh, anywhere you go, you're down 8 to, to uh, 14 percent unless you're in floating rate product, which was what we recommended in our Just Markets webcast back in early January. Here's spreads on emerging market bonds. This is JP Morgan Global Diversified Sovereign Spread Index. And it looks kind of weird because it had Russia in it and then Russia got marked to zero. And so the spreads show more volatility because it's been removed from the index. But uh, basically at 450-ish, on the index were out about 125 basis points from a year ago. And this is one of the reasons, of course, why emerging markets have particularly negative returns. The drawdown on emerging markets uh, index is pretty huge. Uh, 
We see it was worse in 2008 when there was a 30% drawdown on emerging market bonds. But in 2019, in the, into 2020, in the pandemic, it was over 20%. And we almost matched that in this drawdown here that started in the fourth quarter of last year. Emerging markets have stopped falling. Um, we're feeling a more positive on emerging markets, uh, significantly more positive than we did in the fourth quarter of last year when we cut our weightings. But again, we see the spreads are wide. And the scale here, particularly on high yield on the right-hand panel, is enormous. So the widening has been substantial, like 150 basis points. And on uh, investment-grade corporates, the scale isn't as big. But the widening has been, looks like around 50 basis points or so, maybe a little less uh, since we bottomed out in the fourth quarter of last year. Here are the corporate spreads by rating. And it's always uh, noteworthy to watch that gray line in the high yield lower panel and compare it to the other uh, rating slices of high yield, because when that gap widens, it usually means a tightening of financial conditions. It usually means trouble for uh, equity performance. We've certainly seen that uh, recently. Uh, and obviously with the Fed tightening, financial conditions are getting more, more uh, problematic whether you use the uh, Goldman Sachs Financial Conditions Index or, or, or another one, they, also, they all show financial conditions are tightening, and that's going to continue until such time as the Fed uh, starts to see, I think, more convincing signs of uh, supply chain problems uh, disappearing uh, and maybe uh, oil prices uh, stopping, stop going up and the CPI having more of a uh, decline back down towards maybe 5% or so might change their thinking a little bit. We don't think we're going to get below 5% for the year 2022 here. Uh, we do think it'll have a five handle on it, though. Depending on what happens with commodities and oil in the second half, it's possible we end the year with a 6% headline CPI. But right now, it's probably going to be a little bit below that. This is the drawdown on investment grade bonds, which has been uh, pretty uh, historic here. Back in the global financial crisis, it was a 16% drawdown. And then the Fed came in uh, to buy investment grade corporate bonds in the lockdown because it looked like they were going to take out the drawdown of the global financial crisis and usher in all kinds of problems. But they, they uh, steadied the market with their illegal bond buying. And now uh, we see the drawdown just on interest rate risk with interest rates going up so much over the, over the past year. We see the drawdown is about 14 plus percent on investment grade corporate bonds. We see uh, leveraged loan prices were holding up, and then they kind of went into an air pocket in May and dropped uh, across the rating spectrum, dropped about uh, five points or so. They have stabilized as risk assets broadly have stabilized uh, since about the third week of May. Uh, so uh, we see here also worth noting the bottom panel is the spread between the double B loan index and the single B loan index, it has expanded pretty, pretty substantially uh, this year, which is another sign of uh, more difficult financial conditions. This is mortgage-backed securities in the uh, agency mortgage-backed securities market, and it's scattered against investment grade spreads on the x-axis. And then we see the uh, zero volatility spread on mortgages, and there's all these dots on the scatter, and the red uh, square is today. And so basically, relative to high yield spreads, uh, on the, the zero coupon volatility uh, point, we're basically the cheapest ever, among the cheapest ever. There are a few outliers, uh, but relative to this corporate bond spread, we're very, very cheap on mortgages. And uh, we, we think that uh, people have uh, been leery of mortgages, knowing that uh, quantitative tightening was coming. But at these valuations, we are extremely bullish. My friend Harley Bassman, who calls himself the convexity uh, maven. Uh, he wrote a piece about how ridiculously cheap, to his analysis also, mortgage-backed securities look. Here's the spread on uh, the par coupon mortgage compared to a mix of five and 10-year treasuries. We can see it's widened from a very rich level during the, 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 the heat of bond buying by the Fed and also bank demand back in 2021. Uh, both of those things have gone away. There is no bank demand. They're, they're, they're funding loans rather than uh, buying mortgage-backed securities this year. And so we've seen spread wide from 60 basis points to near its average of about 130 basis points, resting at 120. Mortgages are cheap. We've upgraded them across the spectrum of our portfolios. And also, not only is the spread good, but the thing you should be careful with mortgages about is their
callability, the refinanceability causes a less uh, attractive profile for falling interest rates versus rising interest rates when compared to non-callable securities like treasuries. So when this blue line is going down, mortgages are getting risky. So you buy mortgages. Here's uh, the movement of interest rates uh, going back uh, seven years or so. And one thing a lot of people probably don't feel intuitively is that the rise in the interest rates has actually been even more powerful or as powerful as the decline in interest rates. Just look at the right panel, the two-year. It took from late 2018 until basically uh, early 2021, so call it a little over two years, for the two-year Treasury rate to drop from around 3% down to 0.1. And now it's taken less than a year for it to go back up towards that 3% level. So it's actually been rising faster over that period than it fell. So the velocity is very, very high on the increase of two-year Treasury yields. Frankly, I think the two-year Treasury looks pretty attractive at this level. I know it's very negative versus the inflation rate, but it does have quite the advantage versus say a passbook savings account still, and probably will uh, for the life of the two-year security. I think one will make more money holding a two-year treasury than holding cash, even though the Fed is in a height, uh, tightening cycle because you're starting out with such a big gap. This is what the bond market is forecasting the yield curve will look like a year from now. The blue line is today, and the green line is using forward pricing along the yield curve of the bond market, where will your curve be a year from now? Basically, the bond market is priced for a tremendous flattening. Uh, it looks like the 30-year won't change at all based on how the bond market is priced, and that the uh, one-month rate will go up to 3%. Uh, we'll, we'll see, because uh, 3% is still a ways to go uh, between where we are now at 1% or so, or 75 basis points, I think, really, on Fed funds to get it all the way up to 3%, uh, it, uh, it's going to be a challenge because nothing works in a straight line. Uh, it, and I think it would be quite unusual using the, it's not unusual theme, I think it'd be unusual for the curve uh, to do what's being priced to the market. So I think the market's priced wrong, frankly. Uh, and I, I think that uh, basically the yield curve is not going to get up to these levels. Here's our old friend, the copper gold ratio. For the longest time with all the ma manipulation by the Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve, the copper gold ratio didn't work as an indicator. The blue line is copper gold, and it was saying interest rates are way too low. I think everybody knew interest rates were way too low uh, a year ago. And the gap between the blue line and the red line was about the biggest it ever became. But then uh, the market started to normalize, and they, true to form historically, the lines converge. So copper gold remains a great indicator of say a three month to one year view on the 10 year yield, it worked again. And we see now that the 10 year yield actually looks to be too high versus copper gold. Copper gold basically says the 10 year treasury should be maybe 20 basis points lower, but we're very much in the context of this indicator uh, today. One thing that has completely changed, so this has become uh, back, to, uh, back to usual, so it's no longer unusual, that foreigners can no longer make, make money by buying treasuries and hedging them into their own currencies, thanks to the currency movements and the, the short-term rate movements. So what you basically have now is that uh, you only get, if you're hedging into euro, 83 basis points, uh, if the 10-year hedge in the euro, and then if you hedge it into the yen, 13, both German bunds at the 10-year and Japanese uh, uh, bonds at the 10-year are at higher yields than foreigners can get. Uh, this might be a, a this might be a, a reason uh, uh, what might be a reason why uh, rate, rates rose uh, more recently. Here's the 30-year uh, drawdown on a 30-year Treasury, which is pretty epic. Uh, this goes back to 1987, so we don't take this back into the late 70s, but uh, it's down by 38 percent from its high. So the long bond has just been an absolute loser when it comes to trying to hedge. Uh, risk assets. Uh, the concept of risk parity over this period clearly uh, has, has broken down. Uh, here's real yields in the United States based on comparing nominals to tips. And we see, uh, and we see that uh, real yields have been rising. And when real yields go up, that's a real problem for risk assets. And that trend has stopped in the last few weeks. But clearly, this went along with the uh, developing bear market in the NASDAQ and many other uh, more risky uh, stock indices. The S&P 500 also 
dropped more than 20% int intraday, but still hasn't uh, done it on uh, so much on a closing basis. And Dow Jones is uh, still uh, uh, relatively uh, outperforming. Uh, and here's the five-year, five-year forward rate. And this is kind of weird because uh, with all that's been going on, with this volatility in uh, the CPI and many other inflation measures, the five-year, five-year uh, has really not changed at all. In fact, there's been almost no volatility over the past year. It is at a kind of a local high level, but very much in the context. This is this is curious and sort of bears watching. A lot of questions are very are on the same topics. So uh, people talking about Jamie Dimon. We talked about a finan uh, an economic or financial hurricane coming, uh, and what do I think about that? And plus, Elon Musk saying he has a super bad feeling about the economy, and other one number of questions basically saying it's obvious that downward pressure on economic activity is almost a given. So is a recession or even a deep recession inevitable? Uh, and yes, recessions are always inevitable. It's just a question of time and where we are now uh, is in such an unusual place. And we have enough deterioration and we have enough actions going on with the Fed uh, reversing course that yes, a recession is probably coming uh, in 2023 uh, is my guess. And a lot of questions about what would the, the uh, government and the central bank's response to such an, to such an outcome. And I, I think there's basically, they only have one technique and it's to go to, it's to slash interest rates and or go to massive money printing. And I do think that that's coming in the next recession, particularly we're gonna have more free money, I believe. Uh, because there is no other tool. And the, uh, the powers that be do not want a deep recession to develop against uh, the debt burden that we have. And I think we're going to give it, we're going to try that, those same techniques one more time. And that is one of the reasons, again, why I'm longer term negative, very negative on the US dollar. Uh, and, and so it's really the dollar weakness comes with the recession. Um, so, so a lot of questions about the inflation rate. Uh, as I said earlier, I think I would just use my guess for 2022 full year inflation to be around 6%. Uh, there are people uh, talking about oil. Where do I think oil's going? And for the time being, I think that it's pretty clear that like all commodities, the path of least resist resistance seems to be up. So I'm gonna say that I think we'll see this summer uh, the potential for WTI to perhaps hit 150. Uh, it might not last there, but uh, that, that could be uh, something we have to endure. So uh, I would need a much better uh, interest rate setup relative to the inflation rate and just, just nominal interest rates to be a lot higher. Um, someone said, was there ever a zero rate and quantitative easing um, scenario uh, no, hold on, I'm looking at the wrong question. Someone's asking about the old shadow rate of the Fed funds rate, where when the Fed funds rate was at zero and we were doing quantitative easing, we pulled out a study from the Atlanta Fed that said, what would be the Fed funds rate if we actually didn't do the quantitative easing, but went negative on Fed funds? What, how, how negative would Fed funds have to be to have the same stimulant effect of today's zero Fed funds rate if, at that time and the quantitative uh, easing, and they bring out the point that since the Fed funds rate was effectively a lot was was reduced by quantitative easing, doesn't the Fed funds rate uh, get uh, is effectively higher than the nominal Fed funds rate when they're doing quantitative tightening? Yes, and that's a very good point. So as they're doing the quantitative tightening, it's it's double barreled uh, uh, tightening by the Fed, raising the nominal Fed funds rate and doing quantitative tightening is a bad cocktail for risk assets. And so it's going to lead to more unusual, and it's not unusual anymore, the volatility uh, as we, as I think as we get uh, into the later part of the summer into the fourth quarter. Somebody asked what period of my career has the most parallels to today's market environment. It was the first day, uh, it was the first year of my professional career, which is around 1982. Uh, and that was basically the Jimmy Carter uh, aftermath Reagan was there uh, at that time, but it was still felt a lot like the Jimmy Carter, Gerald Ford, uh, such a sort of situation. And it, it kind of feels like that with the negative interest rates being so bad, the energy crisis being so bad, geopolitical problems. Uh, un unfortunately, that was a very tough environment and we're, we're, we're back in it.
Um, someone says, have we ever seen a period of inflation even close to where it is now, where the inflation rate came down significantly with real rates, real rates at all maturity so negative? Not such a sustained period of time, because this has been uh, going on for a couple of years now, but and the inflation rate has just gone up recently. But from 19, post-war, post-World War II and in the 1950s, there was yield curve control. And inflation did have volatility. There were moments when inflation was at 8%, and they had interest rates down at 2.5% two two and at the long end and about uh, three-eighths at the short end. So that was a period like this. That ushered in, at the end of that, was the 40-year bear market in bonds uh, that started basically in the 50s, uh, or late 40s and went into uh, the early 80s. So there was such a period, and uh, it was it was uh, not a bond-friendly period. And then the final question, because we're coming up on time, uh, our country's going to have to buy gold to pay for Russian oil and wheat. You might have to buy rubles to pay for Russian oil and wheat, but they probably would take gold. But that's another uh, aspect about the dollar, is we're starting to see with geopolitical tension uh, with Russia and China being friendlier with each other than they are individually with the United States, which is the opposite of the Kissinger doctrine, which served us well uh, for, for decades. We're, we're now uh, losing uh, our global reserve currency status is slowly slipping away with us having contention with these other powers and with the, jet, with the Chinese economy on the ascent and their savings way above ours, et cetera and their population and, and their GDP and everything else. So the dollar is probably going down. So my final statement is today is Tom Jones' birthday. He's 82 years old, it's June 7th, and I didn't know that when I picked out this title, it's not unusual, I just happen to really like that song. And I learned that Tom Jones is still active. He's a, he's a judge on a, a sort of a, a show called The Voice, one of these talent shows, and he actually sang uh, recently, and he's 82 years old, and the man still has the pipes. Let me tell you, the guy can really sing. So here we are coming on the summer, uh, and it's been a tough year for all assets other than commodities. Uh, we're still buckled in and working hard, and we have t intend on uh, continuing to outperform as we've been doing, as we've talked about uh, for some time now in, in this type of environment. So thank you for your attention. Thanks for your support of Double Line, and goodbye for now.